Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, allow me to start this uh, this talk. Uh, I am uh, Lubomir Říha, and uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, our work on uh, on the parallel rendering using Blender cycles. The work's been mostly done by uh, by Milan Jarosz and uh, Petr Strakos, both of these gentlemen sitting right there. So if you have a que really technical question, they are here to to answer, and. Uh, Without further ado, I'm gonna I'm gonna start. So today I'm gonna be talking about our rendering client for HPC clusters, about our new service that we provide, which is called uh, rendering as a service. And uh, I guess uh, the most interesting thing that you might find is the uh, rendering uh, of large scenes on the on the multi GPU system with shared memory, where your scene is actually where your data are distributed among the multiple multiple GPUs. So this is the overview, and uh, I'm gonna start. So I'm gonna start with the with our rendering client, which is called uh, Cycles Phi. Cycles Phi is pretty much the it's uh, it's a modified kernel of the cycles that we took out of the Blender, and it is designed to run on the HPC clusters. I mean, or in general on any parallel machine that has some interconnection between the between the compute nodes or between the servers so since we are it's primarily designed for the HPC or it was designed with the mind of the HPC it's uh, it's using the for the for the distributed uh, rendering it's using the the MPI which is the standard for the HPC but it can run on any on any <coughs> on any network, even on the internet, it's using the OpenMP to parallelize over the or over the multiple cores of the of uh, of your CPU, and it's it also supports some for for general audience quite exotic architectures like Intel Xeon Phi, both uh, the first and the second generation. The, the, this is the one that we have that we have at our center and we were using it a lot for for instance for rendering the spring movie we also have a, a new a newly supported uh, the multi gpu the multi gpu system we're going to be talking about that uh, uh, in a in a few minutes and also the the arm uh, we are porting the the client to run on the arm v8 architecture so uh, this is kind of an overview of what the cycles does. I mean, as uh, as you see in these pictures, I mean, it's uh, it's pretty much a rendering client to the to the Blender. So you can either you can run the Blender on your workstation or uh, yep, for instance, on your workstation, and then you can have a, a set of rendering clients executed on uh, on uh, on the rendering nodes, and then you just communicate over the sockets with uh, with your workstation. Then uh, this is, for instance, if you have a, if you have strictly a CPU cluster, but uh, if you have a somehow accelerated cluster, th this figure shows that you have a, the Xeon Phi accelerator, but it could be any any server with uh, any number of GPUs and uh, and CPUs. And if uh, there will be any new successful accelerator, I'm pretty sure we're gonna support it. So this is this is the architecture, and then you have again you have a you have your client that's that could be your your blender instance that's running on your on your workstation and you're just getting the the data in uh, in for instance if you're interested in interactive rendering in real time directly to your to, to your client one of the one of the good features of the of the of the rendering client is that it for just performing the ray tracing it needs a significant Significantly lower amount of memory on the actual hardware that performs the that performs the rendering. So we have like uh, this example shows uh, three scenes, where the largest one, the the scene from Spring, actually requires up to 48 gigabytes of memory if you wanna run the full Blender, prepare the scene, and start the rendering. Uh, on the other hand, if you just take the data that you need for, that you need for the rendering itself and you just run the, the rendering 
on uh, using our client, you need just 12 gigabytes of the data. This is a kind of a crucial because the, the accelerators that we have in our center, the, the Xeon Phi, they have a 16 gigabyte of memory and if we wanted to, to use them for the, for the, for the rendering, this actually, this actually allow us to, to use them instead of using a CPU only with the 64 gigabytes of memory per, per node. So, uh, this is uh, <coughs> this is example how we actually did the rendering of the of the Spring Movie on the on the Xeon Phi accelerators. It is they have they need to be treated uh, slightly differently than we would treat uh, 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 a general rendering cluster or general render farm with uh, with the CPU only. So we we need to implement a different kind of, uh, of a load balancing that fits more this kind of architecture. So the, the, the Xeon Phi, it's, uh, it's kind of a 60 core, we have a 60 core CPU, all cores are, in, are sharing the memory, and uh, the, the cores themselves are not as powerful as the CPU. I mean, it's pretty much, the, the basic of the core, it's like a Pentium 4, but it has uh, some extension for, uh, for the vectorization that actually has the real performance, but you need to treat it differently. So for instance, if we wanted to do the, the load balancing among the cores, we, instead of using a tiles, we, we had to implement the load balancing over, over the pixels. And uh, if we wanted to use, and we successfully use up to, up to seven ticks on files to render a single, to render a single scene. So we, we did pretty much the, the we, render the entire scene on the each accelerator so, and uh, we distribute it and a set of samples was rendering for each pixel on each of the accelerators and then we just combi I'm sorry then we just combine the the partial renders uh, the partial samples into into final into final rend uh, render buffer and that gave us the that gave us the the final final product so this is this is a for instance, the the performance difference if we use a different uh, kind of uh, of load balancing, and you can really see that we were able to get from let's say thousand seconds per frame to like uh, four hundred seconds per frame if we were using a uh, fifty of uh, fifty of these accelerators. So, quite significant uh, optimization. So. So this is the Cycles Phi. This is our uh, rendering backend. This is the client that runs on uh, that runs on the cluster, and potentially, as I said, it can run on any 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 farm with uh, with Ethernet network. Doesn't have to be any special HPC HPC network. So it's kind of a it's kind of a backbone of uh, of what we call the rendering as a service. So rendering as a service is a is a service that allows users to use our cluster very user friendly it uh, the idea so it's it's based on uh, as i have already introduced the the cycles phi and it is based on uh, what we call the hippie hippie hip, do i have a slide yes hippie is a pretty much a middleware that's developed by our colleagues at the center that uh, allows people to use a supercomputer in a user-friendly way. So if we have a customer, the customer comes, we prepare for him a website that he can use to submit his work on the cluster. And we take care of everything that's happening on, uh, on the background. So for a user, it's a, it's a very, it's a very easy, easy to use uh, HPC infrastructure, which by default is quite difficult to use. So this is this is the hippie. That's that's the middleware that's kind of translating the, the request from the client to the to the to the cluster. But uh, for the blender, we develop uh, a BHP, which is add-on to the blender, that actually implements the interface to the cluster directly into 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 Blender GUI. So this is this is the example of the of the BHP add-on. So you pretty much uh, since this is uh, for our cluster. You can pretty much choose from a two different kind of resources. The mic is the Xeon Phi accelerator if you want to use the accelerator for the rendering, or if you just or you select the MPP, which if you want to run a massively parallel job on uh, on the CPUs. So then you can just select how many 
how many accelerators in this case or how many compute nodes you, you want to use. And then uh, just by clicking submit the job, you send the data and the request for the rendering to the cluster. It gets scheduled on the cluster and uh, then you have pretty much uh, a list of your jobs that you have submitted. And you can just click the refresh to get the status whether your, your jobs are finished or not. And then if you have a job that is finished, you can just click download results and it will just download the results to the, to the Blender. So it's very straightforward. It's fully integrated into the, it's fully integrated into the, into the Blender GUI. You can then set uh, the typical parameters like uh, this is kind of a specific, specific for the HPC. You have to tell the cluster how long, what is the longest possible time that you want to run the rendering, then the resolution, and how many samples, and that's, that's pretty much it. So it's, a, it's a quite straightforward and uh, it's designed to be as easy to use as possible. So I've already shown this one. So now <coughs> I want to talk about our latest work that deals with uh, this. It's quite a beast. It's NVIDIA DGX2 system. It's a, it's a server, quite expensive server, that has a 16 GPUs in it. It's the high-end uh, Volta GPUs. I guess for your community, it's going to be slightly disappointed because it's not Turing. It doesn't have the RTX core. It's the, it's the generation before that that's been developed uh, specifically for the, for the machine learning and for the high-performance computing. But uh, so the, the server itself has a 16 GPUs. It's Tesla V100. Each GPU has a 32 gigabytes of uh, HBM memory, which is high bandwidth memory. And the throughput to the memory, it's close to the one terabyte per second for each GPU. And then what's the special about this machine? It's how the GPUs are connected to each other. So this, this server has, uh, has, the, has fully connected all GPU, it can be connected to any other GPU with just one hop through one switch. And uh, it allows you that uh, you can have very fast data transfer between the GPU memory. Way, way faster than if you would use the, the PC expressing. I have the numbers on the next slide. The other thing that each GPU have uh, like a six links, and if you want to transfer data from one GPU to another GPU, you can simply use all six links, and you have a full, full potential, full bandwidth, full performance of data transfer between uh, between the GPUs. So, what's the what is the one of the key advantage of such system that actually you can combine all the 16 times 16 GPUs each with 32 gigabytes of memory into 512 gigabytes of a shared memory. So then each GPU has access to any memory of the GPU and it's a, it's a, fully, it's a fully transparent, it's, it's hidden for the user, it's done by the hardware so it looks like it feels like if you're programming a multi-processor system, if you have like a dual socket system, this is just a 16 socket GPU system. But it feels to the programmer like you're programming a multi-core and you have like 16 CPUs in that. The hardware actually does the, does the memory coherence for you. You don't have to worry about transferring the data between the GPU. It's done by the hardware and sits the since the, the underlying hardware infrastructure is very strong and very efficient, it works fairly well. This is just the, this is what, what we call the NUMA matrices, and it pretty much tells you that uh, if GPU zero access a G memory of any other GPU, what is the latency here? So if I'm accessing my own GPU, then the latency is about five microsecond. And then if I'm going over the PCI Express, the latency to get one byte from other GPU, it's about 25 microseconds. If I go to the, to the NVLink, then of course going to my own memory is, is the same, but going to the memory of other GPU is just 10 microseconds. It's only two times slower to get the data from any other GPU. In terms of the bandwidth, if I'm, 
if I read from my own memory at the speed of 850 gigabytes per second. Over the PCI Express, I can, I can, I can transfer the data at 12 gigabytes per second. Over the NVLink, I, can, I have an order of magnitude better, better bandwidth and I'm getting closer to the 130 gigabytes per second. This is, for instance, faster memory access than your CPU have to its own memory. So this is, uh, this is the platform that we, that we used. And uh, now pretty much uh, we've tested this platform. We ported the Cycles Phi to this platform. And uh, as a baseline, we use the GPU how, how it's used in general. So you just du duplicate the data and you render a parse a part of your scene in each of the GPU. So you have to pretty much, you have to duplicate the data in all the, all the GPU's memory. So this is kind of a baseline. And this, is, this figure shows that we have implemented the dynamic load balancing for the interactive rendering. So this says how many frames if we render one sample per frame, and then if we don't move the camera, we just keep incrementing the samples, so the, the frame. The, the bars show how the load balancing work, how it's dynamically adjust to keep all the GPUs equally busy. And you can see that some part of the image are less, uh, less complicated, some are more. In some scenes, it's pretty much, uh, it's pretty much uh, a uniform distribution of the workload. And this is pretty much the performance if you're rendering, if you're rendering one sample per, uh, per frame if you, if you move your camera. So, Yeah. So this is actually the this is the this is just the video that shows how the how we implemented the load balancing because it's going to be used on the on the other slide. So this is the scalability of uh, of a rendering, which means would you if you expect I'm adding extra GPU, I want a half of the time going from one to two. If I'm adding the sixteen GPUs, I want one sixteen of a time. So. The, the dotted line is ideal, the dashed line is uh, with, with the load balancing, and, uh, and the full line is without the load balancing. So, so this slide shows the two benchmark scenes, the agent and, uh, and the classroom. I guess everybody here knows what these scenes are. It's, it's, a, standard, uh, it's a standard benchmark, and this is a, and this is a, a time to render a single, a single frame with one, uh, with one sample. I mean, if you add the samples, it's just, uh, it takes number of times longer, depending how many samples you want to use. This is, these are the different scenes. This is BMW and, uh, and the Pabellon benchmark. And for instance, for the, for the Pabellon, you see that, the, that the, the load balancing that we have quite improves the scalability. It helps a lot. The BMW scene is, uh, it's getting, it's, 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 it's quite small scene. So actually here you are getting closer to the 16 to the 60 millisecond, and it's uh, the, the the data transfer and the synchronization pretty much kicks in, and that creates the overhead that kind of kills the scalability at the, at, at this point. I mean, you would simply solve it that you would render a multiple frames that you, you just need to get to 25 fra frames per second, and you wouldn't render by one sim one sample, but you render by you would render a multiple a multiple samples. So then, okay, what if the scene doesn't fit? the GPU, so I can uh, duplicate the data. So this is actually something that would be the ideal. Every GPU has a, has a nice access to data. Every, every data, it's in, a, it's in its own memory, and this kind of serves as the baselines for another, for another experiment that I'm gonna show. So this is the example one. So I have all the data duplicated. Let's suppose this is the data, this is the cycles internal data that cycles needs to render the scene. This is the input data for the cycles. So I can duplicate the data, or if I'm going to this, uh, to the DGX2, to the shared memory, GPU shared memory system, I can simply distribute the data. I can fully distribute every data structure that I have for the cycles, and I can distribute it uh, evenly. So the GPU zero will have first part of the data, and the number of GPUs define how many, how big the, the chunks are, and then I do that for every data. So I have fully distributed data, but I, yeah. Then I can have uh, some, some slightly optimal distributions. The, for instance, that uh, 
The first array starts. The first array starts in GPU zero. Second array starts in uh, in the GPU one, etc. So I just different kind of distributions of the data. And then the the, the last scene is that some data that are very heavily used, and I have uh, I have an enormous number of accesses to these data, and I can afford to keep them in the memory. I'm just gonna duplicate them to get the best performance. And some large data that are accessed sparsely and or doesn't have such an impact that I'm reading the, this part, this data from a different from the different GPU memory, then I can simply distribute those data. So, and then we run this. Uh, then we perform this uh, this benchmark where we actually start moving one after another the the data structure of the cycles to the distributed memory from the local. And this we identify that like these three arrays have the highest impact. So if I have uh, this is the baseline where I have duplicated data. Then if I start moving these these three arrays. I'm getting 50%, another 33%, and another 20% of the performance penalty. So my rendering time goes from 100% to 200%. So this, we identify that if we are able, because we have enough memory, and we duplicate this data, we can eliminate uh, the, the most significant uh, bottlenecks that we have. And then we also take a look at the, at the size of each of the arrays. So this is for the Pablo benchmark. You see that the the amount of memory that is used by these arrays is, uh, is quite small. So we can easily afford to just to duplicate the data and have the best possible access to it. While, for instance, the, the textures that take 70% of the time, that have only 1% of the accesses. So they have a very small um, impact and we can just easily have them distributed and we save the memory on per GPU. So then, the last case would be that we keep these three, we keep these three data structures duplicated in each of the GPU, and all other data structures that takes most of the memory, we just distribute them. And then you can keep adding the data to this group where you distribute it, depending how large your scene is and how many data. You always want to have your memory full because the more data you have locally, the better performance you'll have. So. Then, uh, but for this case, we just use these three arrays that have the highest performance. So then pretty much if we see that we have, this is the baseline. This is again a time to render one, uh, one frame. This is for, for two GPUs. So this is the baseline. This is if you duplicate the data. And this is the case for, for, this, for this picture where I have these three array is duplicated and all other are, di are distributed. So you can see that the impact is quite small and for mostly all the scenes. It is a little bit slower, but it's, it's still performing as good as if I, almost as good as if I have all the, all, the data all the data in the local memory. And this is kind of true if I'm going to four GPUs, eight GPUs for some of the scenes, some of the scenes stops and potentially to the 16 GPUs where, I mean, you can see that the effect is getting slightly stronger if you're going to multiple GPUs, but still we have, uh, let's say 20, 15 to 20% of the, of the performance penalty while we are able to render up to several times larger scenes on, uh, on such a system. This is just to show uh, what is what, what's the total memory of the, of these benchmarks and how are the how large are the three key arrays that have been have been duplicated. So still, it's uh, it's not it's not uh, it's not the major part of the data that are duplicated. So the final test that uh, that we have was on the on the Moana. Island scene, so we are starting to implement the scene because we really want to have a huge scene in the Blender. So the video shows that DGX really has a 16 GPUs. This is this shows how much memory is uh, is utilized on every GPU. So this is the last case where we the three of the arrays are are, are duplicated and the remaining is an 
and this is the this is pretty much the the interactive rendering of the of the seed. So this video shows we have we're running at 11 frame rate fra <coughs> frames per second, but I'm going to show you the another another set of results. Okay, uh, the the fact is we still don't have the full. I mean, you you don't see the textures. This is still work in progress, but for this is just working with the geometry of the of the scene. But it's still large enough, and it uh, it actually gives us the scene that we need for this kind of uh, for this kind of experiments and uh, and development. So the, and this is just the just the statistics, the 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 facts about the, about the Moana scene. So so we have uh, we have per GPU, as I said, we have 32 gigabytes of data. The, the runtime and the libraries that we're using takes up to three gigabytes of that of that memory. So we have about 29 gigabytes available for our for our user data. So the and the, the size of the entire scene was uh, was a 31 gigabyte. Out of that, the 18 gigabytes have been distributed, in a sense that we just take 1.15 gigabytes per GPU, and then the the arrays that we that we that we duplicated has the size of them was 12 gigabytes. So in total, we used 12.3 plus 1.1.2 gigabytes of uh, of data. So we still have some some memory some memory free, uh, uh, so we can duplicate more data. And this is the experiment that's going to happen. And then the then the rendering times were that for the for the single for the single frame with with the, with the one sample with the HD resolution. If we have fully distributed data, I mean, every array has been distributed. That was that's kind of the worst case. That it was 151 milliseconds, and then we, if we apply the load balancing and we duplicate the data for the for the three key arrays, we get to 27 milliseconds, which translates to approximately 37 frames per second for one sample, or four frames per second if you have a if you're rendering 10 samples at a time and then you just send the data. So, I mean, if anyone is interested, I mean, we are uh, publishing this, uh, this add-on, the add-on that, uh, that's, that is designed to read the Moana scene in, into the Blender. You can find it on this website. I mean, it's still work in progress, but uh, Milan is constantly working on that. And as he updates and he's able to read more and more data from the scene, he keeps pushing the new the new versions to the to the git if you are interested in different informations about the cycles phi and whatever we do with the blender at it4i the blender.it4i.cz is the website where you can find the information and with that i would like to thank you and uh, if you have a question please ask Yes, please. The cycles five, yes, it's uh, we just took the cycles out of the blender. It's a separate uh, small client. It's it's out of the blender. Yes, and again, it can be downloaded from the from the Git here. Well, that really depends on the gentleman who runs the show here, right? They have to agree, become, yeah, we would like to be, but it still needs to be somehow standardized with the, with the general approach that the, that the Blender community has. It's still the HPC environment. For us, it's natural, but for most of the users of the Blender, it's kind of exotic and... Uh, thank you. <laughs>